Well, hello, and it's great to be with you for today's church service. I'd like you to take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 1, as we look at God's Word this evening. We live in very strange times. I think for many of us we are getting over the quarantine stage of uh, government regulation, but I think some are still uh, in fairly strict quarantine in different parts of the world, and, uh, and we've been here for a few months. It's uh, interesting to <clears throat> look back on the last few months. Uh, someone said, don't worry, the coronavirus won't last very long because it was made in China. I don't know whether that's true or not. One person in the Bible knew all about quarantine. He knew all about house arrest. He knew all about prison. And of course, that is the Apostle Paul. And he wrote the letter to the church at Philippi, or the book of Philippians. And uh, he wrote this from Rome. And it's uh, one of what is known as the prison epistles. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And uh, Paul wrote these epistles from Rome when he was in prison. We know that when he was in Rome, he was two years in his own hired house. And then he was uh, taken into prison. And, and uh, uh, tradition has it that he finally had his head chopped off and became a martyr for Jesus Christ. In the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 4, we believe this was the last epistle that the Apostle Paul penned before his death. He said in chapter 4 and verse 6, he said, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. He knew that his time on planet Earth was coming to an end. So Paul was very, very used to being locked up, imprisoned, uh, housebound. And so I think there's some things we can learn from the Apostle Paul. And uh, even as we come out of this time of quarantine and so on, but there's still things we can learn. Because there are, even in, at the best of times, there are times when we are housebound. There are times when we are sick, when we are incapacitated. And we can learn from those times. He definitely was lonely. We do know that. He said in uh, verse 8 of Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to get to a few verses uh, in just a moment. But he said, For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all, in the bowels of Jesus Christ. He was lonely. I know there's been a lot of pastors uh, around the world who have been very lonely over recent months. It is one thing to have a Zoom meeting or a, a YouTube church service, but there's just something about meeting with your, your brothers and sisters in the Lord in person. And so spare a thought and maybe some prayer for your pastor, especially if, if your church is at the stage where you are still not permitted to meet together in person. So how can we profit from prison? How can we profit from prison? Well, here are, here are seven ways that Paul profited from prison from the book of Philippians in chapter 1. And in actual fact, I've reversed this. And, and this is the, if you want a title for this message, this little study, it's seven things that Paul never did, or seven things that Paul never forgot. Paul was often reminded of things, and he was reminding others of things. So here are seven things that Paul did not forget. Here's the first thing. We find it in verse number three of Philippians 1. Let's read it. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Here's Paul writing to the church at Philippi. He said, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. The Apostle Paul never forgot God's blessings. He never forgot God's blessings. You know, we are prone when we, we get into situations that are maybe uncomfortable at best and, and, and painful at worst. Oftentimes we forget about God's goodness. But Paul did not do that. He remembered 
the church at Philippi. He remembered how the church was started. He remembered uh, with Silas when he visited the city of Philippi and he was thrown into prison and beaten up and, and there was the Philippian jailer and so on and, and they met with the women down by the river and then the Philippian jailer was converted and, and so on and, and baptised and, and he, he remembered fondly the startings of that church and, and he commended the church at Philippi. He, he did not forget and we must not forget God's blessings, past blessings. Don't ever forget how good God has been to us. You know, so, and so many people in the world today do not have anywhere to sleep. They don't have enough food to eat. And if there's anything that this uh, uh, being at home during this virus situation has shown us is that we have a lot of food in Australia. Uh, at one stage, we didn't have much toilet paper, but we did have a lot of food. But there's a lot of places in the world today people still don't have a lot of food to eat or they don't have safe drinking water or they don't have a safe place to sleep. There's a lot of people in the world are, are refugees. Now, there are, I know that not all refugees are genuine, but a lot of them are genuine refugees. They are homeless. They are stateless. Some of them are countryless. They don't have anywhere to go. So we have a lot to be thankful for. In fact, we, we, we have the internet, we have relative freedom. Uh, and what, what we call a necessity today was called a luxury a generation ago. Just a few weeks ago, I remember watching a, uh, uh, a documentary on World War uh, II in London and what it was like in London when Hitler was sending his bombers over every night. And there's some dramatic photographs that I saw. And one of them in particular, uh, when the air raid sirens went off, uh, people, of course, went underground into shelters. They got off the streets as, as fast, fast as they could. And there's one particular uh, picture of a, of a subway station in London. And people were sleeping on the platform. They were just crammed in like sardines. And in fact, a lot of them were sleeping on the railroad tracks. All up and down these filthy, coal-strewn railroad tracks, people were sleeping. And uh, <clears throat> most of them were actually, if they weren't asleep, most of them seemed they were smiling, they were talking, they were happy. You know, we, we just don't know how good we've got it these days. So we must always never forget God's blessings. In fact, Paul put it this way, he said, in everything Give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. We must not forget to give thanks. Remember God's blessings. Or if we look at it the other way, don't forget God's blessings. That was the first thing Paul did. Here's the second thing he did not do. He never stopped praying. He never stopped praying. Look at verse number four. Always in every prayer of mine for you all, make him request with joy. Always, always praying for you, making requests for you. The Apostle Paul was a great man of prayer time and time and time again. He said, I, I remembered you in prayer. I remembered you by name. And then he says, remember those that are in bonds. Pray for those that are over you. Um, pray for kings, those that are in authority. Pray, pray, pray. And, and, <clears throat> and for many of us, uh, well, at least for some of us, we've had a bit of spare time. I don't know if I have in the last three months, but some people have had some spare time. And uh, that's a great time to pray. Maybe it's a great time to increase our prayer time every day. And, uh, you know, I wonder how many of us have wasted time um, sitting in front of computer games or if you've wasted time watching Netflix for 10 hours a day or DVDs or whatever, you know, if you've got time... Turn that stuff off and pray. Pray without ceasing, the Bible says. Jesus said, I would that men ought always to pray and not to faint. The Apostle Paul never forgot God's blessings. The Apostle Paul never stopped praying. doesn't matter what his circumstances were. He never stopped praying. And then thirdly, verse number six, Philippians 1, verse number six. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. 
The third thing that Paul never did was this. He never lost sight of God's purpose. He never lost sight of God's purpose. Uh, We must realize that God has a purpose in all the things that are going on. Whatever is happening in your life, God knows exactly what's going on, and he's allowing that to happen. So don't ever lose sight of God's purpose. Um, Oftentimes when we're in very, very dark times, we lose sight of what God is doing. Don't lose sight of that. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, I've been off the road now for March, April, May, almost four months. And to me, it's really strange because I normally spend at least eight to nine months of every year and have for almost 30 years on the road, traveling, preaching, ministry. So to be home, uh, uh, I've... I haven't been anywhere in almost four months. And to me, that is very, very strange. And But I can see God's hand in that. I can see that there was a reason that I needed to be home at this time. And uh, I won't go into the details of that, but there's a very definite reason. And I can see that even for, for my life, God has worked that out perfectly. We don't always understand why God has allowed things to happen. We don't always do. Why does God allow it? Oftentimes we don't know. We just know that God's purposes are always right and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. God knows exactly what he's doing, even if we don't know what he's doing. And as you look around the world today, not just at the virus situation, but at the uh, the civil unrest and the rioting and the looting and the murdering and so on, Really, we don't know what's going on. I mean, we, we, we hear a little bit here and we see a little bit there, but we don't have to know what's going on. We know why it's going on. This age is coming to a close, I believe, and Satan is very, very busy. So we know why it's going on, but we don't necessarily know what is going on. We don't know what to believe, as far as the media is concerned. But we know why. Because there is an end time process, and never ever lose sight of God's purpose. Here's the fourth thing that the Apostle Paul never did. He never misunderstood the power of the gospel. He never misunderstood the power of the gospel. Come down to verse number 12. And just before we read that, here's the Apostle. He's in prison and uh, you know, Roman prisons, I mean, they didn't have air conditioning, they didn't have television, they didn't have three meals a day, they didn't have, um, you know, beds and amenities and stuff, they didn't have any of that. Paul was most probably chained to one or two Roman soldiers. He would have been cramped, he would have been in pain, he would have been cold, he would have been hot, he would have been hungry, would have been thirsty, and all those things. And yet this is what he says in verse 12. So take that in mind. That's the context. But I would, ye should, understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. The things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. He never misunderstood the power of the gospel. You know, this is an incredible opportunity. Uh, And maybe God has, someone has said that God has allowed this thing to happen to give the churches a bit of a kick. You know, there's a lot of people out there we need to reach that we are not reaching. And maybe this is God's way of saying, listen, uh, millennials, generally speaking, are stuck in a bedroom watching the screen. Now, they're playing computer games or they're watching Netflix or YouTube or whatever. But that's their life. And, of course, that's a very sad life for many, many people. I'm not saying they're all like that, but that's a sad life for many. But we have to reach people where they are because they're not going to come to church. So we need to go to them. And if we can't get in and reach them physically where they are, maybe we should reach them through the internet or other means. So maybe... This whole situation here is God giving us a little bit of a a shove or a kick and saying, right, go and reach some of these people. I know of a church in California. I've never been to this church and most probably never will. Um, 
it's it's not my sort of church, but the pastor is an excellent man. And he preaches the gospel 100%. And this fella is premillennial and he is full on salvation by grace through faith. And they have an incredible reach on the uh, via the internet. I mean, they've, they've got huge churches in California. Uh, thousands and thousands normally on a Sunday. But... I think the latest I've heard, and, and they and, and they give an invitation after every uh, every Sunday message, and the the message that I saw, they actually sang "Just as I Am." They sang an invitation song, and then asked people to come and receive Christ as Savior. And by the way, this fellow also preaches on heaven and hell, and making a decision for Christ and re, and and the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and the shed blood, and so on. He's a good man. But there's a number that comes along the screen and, and he says, listen, if, if you have asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save you from your sins or if you want to know more about becoming a Bible-believing Christian, I want you to ring this 1-800 number. And last I heard, since uh, I think it was March, uh, 50, 000, over 50,000 people have rung that number to say, yes, I've either been born again or I, I want to know more about becoming a Christian. I was reading a story the other day. I don't know whether it's true, but I was reading a story about some Christians went up to uh, Minnesota where the, the riots started. Was that about, what, a month ago? Whenever it was. And these Christians went in, and according to this report anyway, as I said, it's not verified, but it wouldn't surprise me. According to this report, people were getting saved. Rioters were actually coming to Christ and realizing that their need wasn't to riot. Their need wasn't rights or whatever they are. They needed to be saved. And people were getting saved and giving glory to God. See, this is a time of great opportunity. And this is what the Apostle Paul said. He said, <clears throat> the things that have happened unto me have happened rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. And so if God allows things to happen so that the gospel may go out in power, amen. Amen. Maybe this, maybe this is one way to reach millennials with the gospel. And not just millennials, but others in this day and age. Number five. He never failed to rejoice that Jesus Christ was preached. He never failed to rejoice that Christ was preached. Look here at verse number 18. Verse number 18. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. He never failed to rejoice in Christ being preached. You know, <clears throat> it's a wonderful thing to know that the churches are out there preaching the gospel. Now, some of the, most of these churches are not my church. They're not my sort of church. It's not my sort of music. They don't use my King James Bible. Um, and so, but that's fine. I don't agree with them on, on that. And some of them are Calvinistic and, and some of them are maybe not premillennial, which is where I'm, I, I strongly stand on all those things. But if Christ is preached, we must rejoice. We must rejoice. And all over the world, people are preaching in different ways, varying ways. And we must thank God for that. Paul did. He said even if uh, people preach out of pretense or if, if people preach uh, whether it's truth or whatever it might be, I rejoice because Christ is preached. That's a wonderful thing. Don't ever lose sight of that. And then number six, he never departed from his perspective on life or his view on life. Look at verse 21. This was Paul's view. This might be Paul's uh, motto for life. This might be his, uh, uh, I'd, I'd, I don't know if he had a tombstone. He most probably didn't. But if he did, I reckon Paul would say, this is what I want put over, I'll put on my tombstone. Verse 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That was his perspective on life. I am leaving here. In fact, he said it in another part of the New Testament. He said, for me to depart this life and to be with Christ is far better. But it's needful for me to stick around for you, for your benefit. 
And we need to understand that, that we are pilgrims. He never departed from his perspective on life. And for us Christians, life is wonderful. But I tell you what, the best is yet to come. We are just pilgrims passing through this land. There was a famous <coughs> preacher, I forget his name. I'm going back most probably 100 years now in a city in America. And he was leaving church late one uh, night. And as he was walking down the city street, he was accosted by a gunman, by a, a robber. And the robber pointed a gun at him. And this is what the preacher said. He said, buddy, fire away. You can't scare me with heaven. And the preacher just walked off. I don't know what I would have done in that situation, but it's pretty good philosophy. You can't scare me with heaven. And Paul might have said that. You can't scare me with, he scare me with heaven. Um, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to depart. My time, the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight and so on. He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The best is yet to come for the believer, for the child of God. Don't ever forget that. And so he never departed from his perspective on life. Lastly, this is the last thing that the Apostle Paul never did. He never relaxed his testimony. He never relaxed his testimony. Look at verse 27. Verse 27. He said, only let your conversation, in other words, your manner of life, the way you live, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. He never relaxed his testimony. You know, it's fairly easy to portray a Christian at church. It's a bit harder to be a Christian out in the world, at university or at school or in your workplace or wherever. But the hardest place to be a Christian is at home. And I know that to be true and you know that to be true. The hardest place to be a Christian is at home. So I wonder how our testimony has been over these last few months. A little bit shaky, a little bit dodgy. You see, when you're at home, you relax. When you're at home, your guard is down. But, you know, we need to be Christians at home too. We need to be kind at home. We need to be faithful at home. We need to be righteous at home. We need to be truthful at home. Paul says this, he said, Only let your, the way you live, your conversation, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Especially if we have little eyes and little ears, little eyes watching this, little ears listening observing what we do in life. Mums and dads, your conversation is supposed to be becoming of the gospel. <clears throat> Young people, your conversation, the way you live, is supposed to be becoming of the gospel. And the Apostle Paul said, look, don't forget that. Don't forget that. I'm sure his testimony was a righteous one, even when he's chained between two big Roman soldiers. The Apostle Paul knew exactly how to react and how to live and, 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 and how to be a Christian during confinement. How to be a Christian. You know, we often, uh, <clears throat> oftentimes when people are really sick, you find out what sort of Christian they are. Or when, when people are unemployed or when people are going through a rough time. You know, it's all right, it's all right to have a Christian testimony when everything's going right. But when things are tough, that's when your testimony is under uh, under scrutiny but it must be becoming the gospel of Christ Paul was a great example he never forgot God's blessings he never stopped praying he never lost sight of God's purpose he never misunderstood the power of the gospel he never failed to rejoice in Christ being preached he never departed from his perspective on life and he never relaxed his testimony. I trust that God may have spoken to your heart on one of these matters today. And uh, if there's someone that is watching this video <clears throat> and you are not a child of God, you are not a Christian, may I encourage you to take note of what Paul wrote under inspiration in the New Testament. 
It's very, very easy what he wrote. The first thing he wrote was this. He said, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We find that in the book of Romans. And then he also said in Romans chapter 6, for the wages of sin is death. Our rightful payment for sin is death. Separation from God for eternity. So we are guilty before a righteous God. But the wonderful good news of the gospel is found in Romans 5, and the Apostle Paul wrote this as well to the church at Rome. He said, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ (coughs) died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus died for me. He died for you. He was buried. He rose again. He was the blood sacrifice for our sins. And so we must just believe that what he did on the cross was sufficient to take away the penalty of my sin and your sin. And if you call on him in faith, he will save you. In fact, he put it this way, Romans chapter 10, he said, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord (coughs) shall be saved. And if you will call on Jesus Christ, he will save you today. Well, until next time, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. God bless you. And we'll see you then.